Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us here virtually this afternoon. Um, thank you in particular to our guests today. Uh, we've got Sarah Berry, who's the blog author of Diary of a New Cyclist. Um, we've got Ruth Cheat, Head of Sustrans Beh Behaviour Change London team, um, will be joining us very shortly. Uh, we've got Shivaji Shiva, who's a solicitor and also working um, as a campaigner with Cycling Works in Birmingham. Um, and we have Sylvia Guthero, who is an advocate uh, for school streets, for cargo bikes, and is a parent and uh, uh, constantly traveling by bike everywhere herself. So um, lovely mix uh, in with us today. Uh, my name's Luke Poland. I'm in the behavior change team in Sustrans London, um, and I'll be hosting today's uh, event. So today's webinar is brought to you by an exciting partnership between Sustrans um, and the fantastic teams behind South Westminster Bids. So that includes the North Bank Business Improvement District, the Westminster Business Improvement District and the Victoria Westminster Business Improvement District. So uh, the South Westminster Bids are working with partners like Sustrans to enable active travel journeys to, through and within the uh, central London areas. Uh, with the goal of supporting people to travel for work or for leisure safely and with confidence. So there's actually a, a website that I really like to point everyone uh, here towards today. So that's the North Bank Business Improvement District uh, website on cycling. So if you type in www.thenorthbank.london forward slash cycling, you'll find yourself there. Um, and as well as that, if you've got any questions about cycling uh, or active transport, uh, walking or cycling within the central London area, um, feel free to get in touch with the team from South Westminster Bid. So you can do that with uh, the email info at the North Bank London. So for those of you who've not heard about Sustrans before, we're a UK based charity and we're making it easier for people to walk and cycle. Our mission is to create healthier and happier places uh, and healthier and happier people. So in particular, we look at how we can use walking and cycling to influence the livability of towns and cities. Um, and also we make a push to make sure paths, whether they're cycle superhighways, whether they're rural national cycle network trails, make sure they're inclusive and accessible to everybody. So North Bank and the South Westminster Bids and Sustrans are looking at ways we can leverage walking and cycling to breathe life and energy back into the central London area. Um, enhance the employee well-being and also boost workplace productivity in the context of COVID-19 and the challenges that obviously accompany uh, living through a global pandemic where we, we all do still need to get around. So we're busy planning more activities with South Westminster bids uh, and more interventions to support people to walk and cycle to the area. And we hope we can share a bit more detail about that in the not too distant future. Um, just to kick, before we kick things off, a little bit of housekeeping. As I mentioned, we've got Sylvia, Ruth, Shivaji and Sarah joining us today. Each speaker will have around eight to 10 minutes to present. Um, speakers, I'll, I'll chop you off at around 11 or 12 minutes. Um, uh, and then we'll have a, a Q&A panel for about 20 minutes at the end. So to everyone who's joining us today, if you have any questions, please, um, there's a Q&A section at the bottom. You can use that. Um, to drop a question in and one my fantastic colleague Reese will be is joining us today and he's going to help um, sort through the questions and make sure we get um, the best questions through to the presenters. Um, if you have your questions for a particular panel member just make sure that that's clear in in your question. You can also use the zoom um, chat function as per a normal zoom call um, and you can select whether your message is shared with all the attendees or just with the panel. Um, so just be conscious of who you're sharing questions with. Um, that's more or less everything I have to cover. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Sarah Berry. Sarah is new to relatively new to cycling um, and has recently discovered the joys and freedoms of traveling around London by bike. Sarah is also a prolific tweeter and has promoted uh, all the amazing ways that cycling and walking um, and healthy, happy cities can actually make our lives better um, and has amassed quite a, quite a following in London and around the world. So over to you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me, Luke. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. If you told me 
you know, three months ago or maybe four months ago that I would be talking to a group of people who were nervous about cycling, about getting started, I would have laughed in your face and then walked off probably. Um, but here we are, the world is a strange place. Um, I was invited by lovely Luke to um, have, a, have a bit of a presentation, which at first I wasn't quite sure how to do, given that I was just going to talk about my experience of cycling. Um, but that being said, you know, I... I have a little bit of a, a different sort of experience of cycling, I think, to, to most people, or, or at least it felt like I did a little while ago. Um, I never learned how to ride a bike as a kid, like most people do. I never, never got off my stabilizers after having an unfortunate incident with a hill and some failed brakes. Um, so, you know, it wasn't until maybe two years ago that I did the TFL cycle confident course that I actually learned how to stay upright on a bike that didn't have stabilizers on, stabilizers on it. Um, and it wasn't until June of this year that I got my first bike and started riding around um, London. So, so when I was asked to, to sort of have a bit of a presentation, I wasn't sure what to include, but then I remembered much like a proud parent who would film their, you know, four year old who was just learning how to ride a bike. My wonderful partner has been taking many a video of me as I, um, like discover cycling in in London so I thought I'd show you just a couple of those very short clips of me absolutely beaming on a bike um they're not the best quality but you've got this is the day that I bought my my bike my bike home um riding through through Brockwell Park which was about as you know dense of a, of a riding environment that I was happy with um a couple of weeks later riding through through Peckham on the newly pedestrianised sort of main street there um, that you can see you've got a lot of people walking, a lot of people cycling in a, in a cheeky motorbike there as well. Um, and then a couple of weeks after that, again, cycling on the road, coming down from, from Crystal Palace um, on a hill that I would not recommend cycling up, um, but going down is, is, is quite enjoyable. Um, and, you know, those sort of probably the day before I did any of those bike rides, I would have said that that would have been impossible for me. I never sort of saw myself as the kind of human who was capable of, of riding a bike. Um, I don't have a, I'm, I've got terrible balance. I had bad experience as a kid. And, you know, to be completely frank with you, I was terrified of cycling in London. Um, I thought I was going to get hit by a car or I was going to fall off my bike and make a fool of myself or some other sort of disaster was going to happen um, and everything was going to be terrible. Um, but then announcements about the low traffic neighborhood schemes were made and I found out that there was going to be one right where I lived. Um, and I sort of said to myself, you know, what is it that you are waiting for that is going to get you actually out on a bike? You know, you've got governments from the national government to your local authority making measures to try and make you feel more safe and more comfortable and, and more confident in, in doing that thing. Um, you've got friends and family around you who will who will support you to sort of get on the get on the bike um so i decided that i had not any more excuses basically and it, it was it was it was time to give it a go um and i found that getting my own bike actually made a massive transformation for me it's something that i would recommend for for anyone who's thinking you know about this and it doesn't have to be a fancy bike it can be a second hand one it can be something through your cycle to work scheme if your work offers it um but actually having something that is your own and that is something that you feel an attachment to that you've made an investment in that you can practice on repeatedly and that gives you the opportunity to to cycle a little bit every day is really important um and when you do get that bike sort of like my first tip for, for new cyclists would be to make sure that you have a go at trying it out before you actually walk away with it. Um, I had cycled on Santander bikes before and a couple of other higher bikes um, in different European cities and had felt incredibly uncomfortable and really awkward on all of them and felt like I wasn't in control. Um, and the minute I stepped on my bike, I didn't have that feeling, you know, it was light. It was, I felt like I had my balance. It felt sturdy. It felt like, that I wasn't at risk of, of falling off at any particular moment. Um, and that really made a, made a sort of boost to my, to my confidence. So making sure you find a bike that feels right for you. Um, mine is pink. I have a matching helmet. I often dress to match my bike. That is something that feels really good for me. For others, you might want something that like can go really fast and looks really slick. You might want an electric bike, like whatever it is, that's fine. Just sort of express yourself through that and that will make a big difference. Um, 
the second tip that I have for, for folks just getting started is to, to not be afraid to take the lane. Um, and this is something that I really didn't understand um, until I got on a bike. I think when you're new and just starting out, you can have this real fear of um, taking space away from cars because you feel like the road doesn't belong to you or it belongs to drivers and you're in the way and you're slow and you know you might get hit so you try to go as close as you can to the curb to, to keep out of their way um, but actually all that encourages drivers to do is to, to overtake you you know in a way that is a bit more dangerous or a bit closer than they that they probably should um, so so my sort of most joyous cycles have come when I sit right in the middle of the lane and not feel bad and know that you know it's going to be what maximum a minute or two that a car is going to have a safe opportunity to overtake me and you know really believe that I am just as you know worthy of that space as 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 the other road users whether or not I'm in a I'm in a in a car or on a bike or walking or running or whatever it is that I that I choose to do on the road um, a bit of kit that I think is really useful to get is something called a quad lock um, so it's partly a phone case that looks a little bit like this that has a like latch on the back of your phone case and it um, there's a little contraption that attaches to the handlebars of your bike which means that you can attach your phone to it as you're cycling um, I am terrible at directions oh we've got another one we've got another one over there um, I'm terrible at directions um, and I also don't like stopping and starting um, on my bike so the ability to have sort of google maps or city mapper up on my phone and I can just look down and scan what turn I have to make um, makes a huge difference for me especially because I know a lot of people will listen to directions but I quite like to be able to hear the noise of the traffic around me because I'm still a bit a bit sort of nervous um, on being nervous there is absolutely no shame in getting off your bike. Um, I think that this is this is one of the things that, you know, it took me a while to, to realize like, what happens if I get to an intersection that I'm not comfortable riding in? Um, and the answer to that is you just stop and get off and walk um, and drag your bike along with you. Um, that is, you know, I know people who have been cycling in London for over 10 years who still do that with tricky intersections. Um, it's something that you, like, or at least I'm not gonna speak for everyone, but at least to me, I feel like I have to be great at a thing straight away um, and that any admission that I'm not great at a thing is super embarrassing. Um, and, you know, I've, I've really gotten over that. Um, I will get off my bike if the intersection looks, you know, tricky. I will get off my bike if there is a slight hill and I don't feel like getting sweaty on that particular day. Um, I will get off my bike if I see a good dog and I want to walk at the speed of the dog for a little while. You know, I just have absolutely no qualms with that and I encourage others to have that too. Um, and the last sort of tip is just to, to enjoy it and have fun. I think, you know, it took me a few rides to, to let go of the sort of adrenaline and fear that I was doing something that I never thought I'd be able to do to stop and enjoy it. But, you know, while I've been riding, I've stopped at traffic lights next to people who have taken their headphones out and had a conversation with me. You can, you can interact with people around you. You can talk to pedestrians. You can wave at dogs or squirrels or, or whatever wildlife gets you fancy. Um, if you, you know, I'm a, I'm a big person of like, we should, if ever someone says to me, we should do that one day, I'm a big person of being like, well, why can't that day be now? Why can't this be a thing that we do right now? And to me, cycling is such an enabler of that. If you cycle past a coffee shop that looks great or a restaurant that looks great or a friend you haven't caught up with in ages, you know, you don't have to worry about stopping and when the next bus stop is or any of that sort of stuff, you can just get off your bike and, and do that thing that you've always looked forward to doing right then and there. Um, you know, it's, 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 I can't really stress enough how much I thought that this was never going to be an option for me. Um, and, you know, now I've cycled 10 miles to Kingston. I cycle in central London. There's, there's sort of nowhere that I'm, that I'm too nervous to cycle. Um, and I'm really bad at it. I, I still can't signal. I fell off my bike the other day. Um, that was fine. Like, you know, I'm, I'm by no means an expert. Um, but once you get out there, it's, it's nowhere near as intimidating as you think. So I recommend giving it a go. And um, that's it from me. Thanks, Luke. Amazing, amazing. Some some awesome tips there from you, Sarah. Thanks for sharing those. And I'm also really stoked to hear that your bike is pink, uh, same colour as my bike. So go the pink bikes. Um, I think one day we'll live in a world where every bike is pink and that will be, we've, we've all achieved our mission there. No, take a bike, whatever colour you like. Um, <laughs> thanks so much for that, Sarah. Uh, next up, we have got on the list, um, Sylvia Gothero. So Sylvia is a parent. Sylvia is coordinator of the London uh, cycling campaign in Brent. So uh, Sylvia is a cargo bike user and 
uh, also a passionate campaigner for school streets, helping to uh, helping families to travel to schools safely um, and actively. So thank you, Sylvia, for joining us. Over to you. Thank you, Luke. Um, let's just do this. Um, so, um, yeah, so I've decided to speak about, uh, to talk about family cycling because uh, this is how I uh, started cycling again uh, when I had my children. I used to cycle when I was uh, younger as a student in Paris because this is where I'm from. Um, and I, I only started again um, because it was a necessity for me to cycle the school run. Um, I will explain later. Uh, so first of all, family cycling um, is not really new. Uh, we've uh, kind of moved away a bit from that kind of setup, but that's something that we've uh, been doing for, for a while. So where do we start? Um, at the beginning, uh, um, cycling during pregnancy. Um, so it's okay to do that. Uh, I didn't do that because as soon as I found out I was pregnant, I actually gave my bike away because I thought it wasn't um, suitable. Um, and I deeply regret that. Um, since then, um, the um, official advice is um, um, obviously gentle exercise. It's always recommended when um, you are pregnant. And now it's officially accepted that cycling is actually very good for you. Obviously, we're not talking about uh, mountain biking, but as long as it's a gentle and that you listen to your body um, and you are the person who knows it best, uh, it's completely fine. Um, it's also very good for your mental health. Uh, so that's a lovely picture of a lady uh, pregnant cycling and bonus point for cycling with clogs. Um, so this is the official advice from the, um, the chief medical officers in the UK and it's been the official advice since 2017. Um, it's particularly important for the, the mood and the, the mental health um, side of things because as you know pregnancy is, um, and childbirth is actually a traumatic experience for um, someone's body. So it really helps build up the reserve that you will need um, later on. So once the child is here, you've got um, quite a lot of different kind of setups that could be used. Um, so for instance, with one child, you could have um, a front seat, a back seat, you could have um, a trailer, you could have a cargo bike. Uh, when they get a bit older, you can have tandems, tow bar, follow me type of things. You can have, um, Obviously, the children could also start cycling um, individually next to you. There's really um, no limit to what you can do. When you have multiple children, it's still possible. Uh, so you can have bigger trailers, you can have triplets. Uh, that's a tandem with three people um, cycling. You could have cargo bikes uh, with the box in the front, um, at the back, uh, like a long tail. Uh, some cargo bikes can carry up to six children. So um, that's really um, no limit at all. Um, this is the picture of my children um, at the bottom right there and um, so if you're like me and there's nothing for them to cycle individually and independently to school you have to carry them all the way through primary schools but that's you know great fun anyway. Um, so there's uh, one particular um, group, a Facebook group called Family Cycling UK which is an incredibly um, uh, resourceful uh, place to find any kind of um, advice um, and opinion and recommendation. Um, I did put out to them uh, what was the most important reason that made them choose to cycle. Usually it's the school run, the, the biggie, when you um, talk about family cycling. So those are the reasons that they've um, given. Um, so it's too far to walk because cycling is uh, pretty much uh, walking the more efficiently. Um, better awareness about the impact of driving short local trips. Um, better awareness of the climate emergency, the school get chaos. Some people were saying that they felt guilty to be kind of responsible for that. So they've uh, looked at other options. Road pricing, uh, general cost of driving. Obviously nowadays, um, because of the health emergency, we are told to avoid public transport and to cycle and walk if we can. So that's one way to really keep your distance. Uh, it's obviously quicker by bike. Um, some people were cycling um, before having children, so it was like a natural progression for them to um, carry on and just adapt. Uh, some people can't drive, and it's always um, assumed that everybody's driving, everybody has their driving license, but it's not necessarily true. It's great fun. <laughs> it's good exercise, and uh, it's always when you have a family with young children, you know, any kind of 
uh, exercise, it's even harder to kind of fit it within your life because the, the schedule is just so busy with everything and the family logistics is a good way to just do it. And it's just so great to have this little time for yourself as well, because even if you cycle with them, um, it, it's still a very nice, very you know, quality time with them or just with, with yourself, with your own head. Um, and the necessity to be able to do multiple um, multi-stop trips. Um, it's the woman who um, usually kind of take care of the dropping off, picking up, but disproportionately is still woman. And we know that women are more likely to do also other things. So it's, it's, it's a way, for me, it was the only way I could do all those things. It was the only way for me to drop the children off, go back, go to work, and do the same in reverse, maybe pick up some groceries on the way. That was the only way I could do that, otherwise I would have never been anywhere at any time on time. And the spontaneity, so that's really important. The independence and the, the, the idea that even when you have a family with young children, you're still able to say, okay, oh, let's go for a picnic. Um, it's just incredibly important. So this is what we usually do. Um, it's just so much easier than, you know, any other way to carry all the bags and the children. So these are some um, examples of the setup uh, that you could have. So you've got all kind of things like the triplets on the top left. You've got a back bit type, which is a, a babble kind of um, uh, cargo bikes with a, a toddler and a little baby. Um, you've got all a combination with different uh, child seats for that family um, middle bottom picture. You've got the long tail on the top right, and you've got a combination with so that's a tandem with a follow me tow bar and a child seat at the back. So uh, what let people decide? So I think the seeing other people or knowing someone who um, cycle as a family, it's, it's, it's a very good trigger and it, it helps you feel that you are not alone or you're not weird. Um, so more we see family uh, cycling together, I think more, um, normal it will feel and uh, better it will be for everyone. It's important to have um, a support network. So the Facebook I was talking about is incredibly important because uh, there will be days where you may have been on the other end of a, you know, a, a nasty comment or ignoring comments. And even if you have to ignore it, it's, it could be hurtful. So it's always good to be able to talk this thing through with people who understand and who've been there as well. Um, also, because Obviously, children grow, so you will your setup will, will evolve, and you will have different kind of things. So it's always good to kind of compare notes and ask people recommendation or how do they deal with certain things. Um, this particular group is just incredible. You can ask anything from what kind of insurance you have, how do you pack your um, your um, cycles outside your house overnight. Um, can you try? Because some sometimes you would want to try it's very important to try kind of different sets up or cargo bikes there's so many now so you could find people living next near you and you can ask them to either could you, you could try their setup and see if it works for you so the things that we need um so more family cycling because it will lead to more family cycling um if we could have more groups as well like the family cycling libraries so that's again um um, ties in with the trying before buying so we you can borrow some equipment and see if it works for you a financial incentive to support choice because some of those cycles are fairly expensive it's a one-off expensive but on the long term it's cheaper than um, even tra public transport but it's always kind of difficult to you know the, when you see the price tag you say oh my god so um so that would be good that it's recognized that's something that actually if you, you know having a swapping system with a car for instance a lot of people will go into family cycling and get rid of the second car for instance so it's important to support those people uh, more inclusive infrastructure direct and convenient because the logistic of families are very complex so you need something really direct convenient simple you don't want to have you know we don't have the time to take the scenic route to go to school in the morning more inclusive secure parking facilities um so that Again, it's within this whole thinking about a, a provision for cycling. We really need to take it on board that not every cycle is a bicycle, very slim, light kind of um, um, machine. And uh, fewer uh, physical obstacles, all the barriers and the gates that really are, um, make it impossible for um, family cycling to, to do and go where they want to uh, go. Uh, in terms of resources, 
So that's the Family Cycling UK Facebook group. I thoroughly recommend um, you joining. Uh, there's about 6,000 people now on there. Uh, you can ask them anything. Um, how do you keep your children um, dry or warm uh, in winter to, to anything? They will always have someone who uh, will be happy to answer. Cycles Prog, that's a brilliant website as well. Lots of reviews of different equipments and advice. Join your local walking or cycling or better street, healthy streets kind of um, groups because you need to be part of the conversation and you need to uh, voice your needs. Um, so, you know, finally things will change. Uh, the same with uh, councils. At the moment, there's a lot of them who would have um, um, a transport recovery plan, maybe with an online platform where you can drop pins and ask. Um, a specific provision or you know highlight that there's an issue there so that's quite important be part of that conversation there's the cycle buddy schemes um, in so that was um, that's an initiative which is now coordinated by uh, London cycling campaign um, and I know that in Brent we do have someone who is doing uh, the school run cycling and uh, that person offered to help someone else to you know, get started so that's quite important uh, quite a few training um resources transport for london lunch and online course quite good just have a look or check with your council if they do offer uh, training uh cycle streets for navigating because um, i always get lost and that's one i was one of the deterrent at first i, I was always afraid to go a bit further because i would get i would be getting lost beyond the bicycle coalition so that's a coalition of um disabled cycle user family cycling cycle logistic uh, companies uh, and we are campaigning for a um, more inclusive infrastructure and built environment and i thoroughly recommend if you want to get inspired to watch that uh, mother lord movie is just incredible and i think it's available on vimeo um and that's it thank you very much so you can find me on twitter at uh, quickwood mum and uh, at those email address and also uh, just think that if we see more of those children cycling, um, it's, it would lead us to them being less reliant on driving and that's what we want. So um, there you go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia. I really, really appreciated uh, hearing, hearing from you. And I, I love the, um, all the different uh, cycles, the pictures of the different cycles you shared. I guess it's a a reflection a little bit on how everyone's families are so many different shapes and sizes and and that um, really should be reflected in the types of bikes or or maybe not bikes maybe the types of cycles because some some cycles have more than two wheels so um, thanks so much for that Sylvia um, next up we have Shivaji so Shivaji Shiva is a solicitor and an active travel campaigner in Birmingham um, Shivaji set up the Birmingham Bike Works website and is recruiting businesses to get more people cycling um, to work. Um, and Shivaji, I also understand you've got some links with business districts in Birmingham as well. Mm -hmm. um, over to you. Thanks very much, Luke. Um, I'll start by um, sharing my screen. I'm hoping you can see that uh, now. Brilliant. I'm seeing at least one nod. Um, so uh, that's who I am. And that's really just because um, I thought I should repeat. I'm Shivaji Shiva. And um, I'm a charity lawyer. So I sort of set charities up, close them, and um, help them with other things in between. And in doing that, um, I've been cycle commuting pretty much um, for the last 20 years or so. Um, and, and that might be the right moment at which to say that I'm not completely here under false pretenses. Um, I'm a Londoner originally um, and I spent quite a lot of time commuting from Brent um, where uh, Sylvia's group worked, um, from Kenton in fact, um, into town, into Labbot Grove um, and later into Putney um, and that sort of came about by accident um, and I wanted to just explain how I came to commute by bike um, why I would say I'm a slightly unlikely cycle commuter um, and try and draw out a couple of lessons about um, what mattered to me in making that possible 
um, and why it was a little bit easier for me in the end and what we can do to make it easier for other people to, to join and cycle commute. Um, and I think this, the place to start really um, is with this book, um, which is, um, I, I happened to notice earlier that I think Luke's got a, um, a rally chopper on his t-shirt. This is the Tomahawk, the, the, the less cool version um, uh, for littler kids, which I was lucky enough to get as a Christmas present um, back in the 80s. Um, and that's what saw, um, saw me start to um, ride a bike. More specifically, my moment of joy in learning that I could ride a bike was, uh, was came at, um, as a result of someone's older brother. I still don't know quite who, but I was trailing around with a group of friends in Woodcock Park in Kenton, um, in the suburbs of Zone 4, and um, I still hadn't worked out how to ride my bike, so I was sort of wheeling it along um, and scooting occasionally. And at some point in that, in that process, someone's older brother was a bit bored, grabbed the back of that bike and um, sort of steered me around. And I can still remember the moment when I looked back and realised um, that I didn't have anyone behind me and I was actually riding the bike. Of course, like many of those moments that ended a few seconds later in a crash, um, but I did carry on riding the bike. And essentially, I think that joy, that moment of freedom is what has um, left me continuing to, to ride and wanting to, to fit that into my day-to-day -day life. Um, but immediately after, um, after that, I spent a few years um, having not learned a lot from riding that bike because it's an enormously impractical thing, a tomahawk. Um, I've got to say, I think the chopper's rather similar. Uh, sorry, Luke. Um, but, um, you know, I tootle around on it a little bit. I eventually learned how to fix a puncture which I think is something that any new cyclist um, could do with getting to. I don't think it's a problem if you can find a local bike shop and not do it yourself. But I think there's some sort of empowerment in knowing that if you do get stuck, and even if it takes you a lot longer than um, the, the roadies take to, to fit a bike, um, the sort of people who sit by the side of the road and seem to get it done in five minutes, that you know you can eventually um, sort out a puncture and get your bike working again. So that's about as far as I got at that stage. But eventually I was given, um, I think my, my dad won some money on the pools and I ended up with a 10 speed drop handle bike, bike of the sort that was com common then. And that was a point for me at which I started to ride a little bit more. I was um, probably 12, 13 at the time. And um, one of the, the core pieces of that, that stage was that suddenly I found myself um, riding a bit further and enjoying the independence that you can enjoy in your teens and tweens. Um, and I got a bit further from home. And almost without realising it, within about six months, I'd, I'd lost and a stone and a half of weight because I was a bit of a podgy child, um, not athletic, always the last one to, to be selected in, um, in games and, and not remotely the sort of person who'd be associated with physical activity ordinarily. Um, but suddenly I found I could get around and it was a lot less effort and I could join in with um, friends and get out on my bike and, um, you know, get about the city, which um, took me on. And so there I was happily enjoying that. And before I knew it, I was um, off to college and the freedom that brings, taking my um, trusty 10 speed with me um, and um, probably ignoring it for a lot of the time, to be honest, but also finding that um, courtesy of someone else's enthusiasm, I, I'd suddenly end up cycling from Exeter to, to London in stages, seeing friends during one of the holidays and learning that that bike could take me just a bit further than my friend's house around the block. Um, and so I at least got the hang of the idea that I could go a bit further by bike. Um, <clears throat> And then if you fast forward from there, um, I'm now um, lucky enough to have a daily commute of about five miles. Um, and um, I can do that along a towpath and do it when I want to, wearing the suit that I would wear to work. So it feels like an effortless um, way of getting to work and a real joy um, day to day. And the key piece for me being that um, I get up in the morning and when we're not in lockdown, I can cycle to the office. Um, by the time I um, have got to work on my bike in the 25, 30 minutes it takes me, I've completely forgotten 
the demands of being at home. I've forgotten the things that my kids were calling for. Um, I've forgotten um, the things that I had, forgot I had failed to do for my wife the night before, and I'm ready to start work. And likewise, on the way home, I can forget the demands of um, work, the email that I ought to have replied to, um, the phone call I should have um, responded to, and I can get home and feel that I've had that break in the day um, and really enjoyed just a bit of time for me before diving into um, uh, sort of demands of home life that Sylvia was talking about earlier. And um, going with that comes um, some exercise. I've mentioned I'm not the most um, physically active sort of person and it has to be said that a cycle commute was the one thing that, that squeezed into my day 25 minutes, 30 minutes of exercise at each end. And, um, you know, as, as you get on, um, obviously that is more and more important. And I know that it's important for my wellbeing. I know that, that I feel much, much better when I'm able to get out and about. And somehow um, it's just not as easy to get to the gym, to get out and do these things when they're not an integral part of your day. Whereas, um, when I'm cycling to work, I know that it's the quickest way to get there. I have to say, I have days in, in the winter when it's raining and I think I'll just jump on the train. And those days are normally um, isolated efforts. And the reason for that is really simple. It's not that I wouldn't quite like to sit in a warm train. It's that by the time I get to work, I realize I've spent 15 or 20 minutes longer um, on the cross city line here in Birmingham than I would have done if I just cycled along. And often, um, I find that when I um, get to the station, the rain that's persuaded me that I perhaps ought to give it a, give it a try and um, jump on a train has also meant that the train's cancelled or is rammed with other people choosing to take a different route in. So um, I find that cycling really, really fits with my day, works really well. And I can add a sneaky tip there, which is that actually there's a real joy to cycling in the rain. So um, I think I hear a lot when I'm talking to people about um, whether they might cycle to work, about their concerns about the rain, about bad weather. Um, I'm now campaigning for a low traffic neighbourhood and I hear a lot from people who think that's a bad idea, um, who say, well, look, all this cycling will stop the moment the summer is over. And I have to confess to them, well, sometimes it's the best bit of my day when I get to work and I realise that I'm soaked um, uh, and I've been out in the rain and the wind, but actually I feel quite good for it. Um, the process of getting from... Um, I, I might just call time on you in a minute, Shivaji, if okay. you're able to wrap yeah, things sure. up in the next 30 seconds. Sorry about I this. I can do that. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Um, so in terms of other tips, the things I wanted to say were, um, um, I, I emphasize getting a practical bike and um, it's worth bearing in mind that you can do that at a relatively modest cost. Um, Having had my first couple of bikes given to me, I, I had to buy them. Um, and the first one I bought, I bought because I thought I needed a proper bike. And in fact, I was told by one of my clients at, at the stage that it was a proper bike. But these days, everything I, I ride has um, hub gears, has um, integrated um, lights and um, mud guards. And it cost 150 quid, 200 quid. So this, this bike actually costs a little bit more than that, but then it's a cargo bike, which I use for my shopping. And when I bought it from Elephant Bike, which is a fantastic local charity, um, they also sent one off to Africa. Um, and I just wanted to close by saying that I'm um, busy um, locally, quite involved in low traffic neighborhood campaigning. And that's important in two ways. The first is that the thing that, that really holds people, um, prevents people from um, cycling, to work is well recognized as being their sense that it's dangerous to do so. And my experience is that, that it's possible to get past that and to um, cycle. And it was great to hear Sarah talking about taking the lane um, and um, being confident in that way. But I think we all know that it would be um, easier to do so if there were more cycle lanes. So I would endorse the call that you heard from Sylvia to join your local cycle group and find a way to help um, call for that safe infrastructure. Uh, we're doing it in Birmingham, and this is just a little note from the family of Dan, Rafe and Harriet. I feel like safer streets could be the way forward. Um, and that's perhaps uh, enough for me, except to say that if there's a, a practical tip I have, it's not down to the three things that I think I, I um, 
found most useful, which are warm gloves, um, a decent jacket and um, solid shoes. But actually, um, it's just about finding a way to enjoy your cycle ride. And perhaps the easiest way to, that, to do that is to find a couple of people um, in your local area who cycle themselves and enjoy it. Because my experience is that they're almost always happy to share the joy, share their experience with you. Luke. Amazing. Thank you, so, thank you so much, Shivaji. I think that's definitely true. There's always a lot of people who have found the joy of cycling are always happy to share that with people around them. So definitely if you're, um, if you're, if you're thinking about cycling, reach out to people. And if you, if you tuning in to this webinar and you are um, a confident, comfortable, um, happy uh, cyclist, make sure that you, you share that with other people around you as well. Make sure you um, join a campaign and, and spread that, spread that happiness um, as well. So thanks so much for that Shivaji. Um, finally, uh, Sustrans' very own Ruth Cheert um, will be joining us. Ruth is uh, the head of the behavior change team in London um, and has worked across schools, communities and workplaces to support um, everyone to travel in happier and healthier ways. Um, I might just hand over to you, Ruth, and we're just a little bit short on time. So maybe if, if possible, Ruth, you're able to um, squeeze it into eight minutes, that'd be superb. Sorry about that. I think no worries. Um, yeah, so firstly, I just want to thank Sylvia, Sarah and Shivaji for all those really useful insights. Um, and Luke's already introduced me, so I won't do that, but just that our work is really about empowering and supporting people um, to travel in happier and healthier ways and supporting people with the kind of barriers that, you, that we've been talking about today. And we're really passionate about making cycling for everyone. So that really does mean like working with people to look at all these different kinds of barriers and find out what's going to really um, help people to make those changes in their lives. Um, and helping people to identify specific barriers and needs and to address those. Um, and I know that yeah, the previous speakers touched on, um, covered a lot of these issues, which is really helpful. Um, and so I'm going to talk first a little bit about the importance of cycling. Um, I've got a few facts for you. Um, cycling is, or active travel, sorry, rather than cycling. Um, is actually seen as a miracle cure for a lot of things. So the chief medical officer, previous, um, previously a chief medical officer, Sir Liam Donaldson, um, actually noted that if um, there was a medication that existed which had a similar effect, um, it would be regarded as a wonder drug or a miracle cure. Um, and that's really important. Um, it's something that potentially could have a massive impact on the nation's health and on individuals' health. Um, so currently about a quarter of adults in the UK report having less than 30 minutes of physical activity a week, which is a lot of people, and this obviously can lead to a lot of health problems. Uh, and in, inactivity is actually fourth on the WHO's biggest killer list. Um, we only need 150 minutes of moderate exercise a week. Um, in order to combat this, which is actually really easy and cycling or walking can definitely do this for us. So some figures from the UK, um, about a third of men and almost a half of women don't meet this threshold for activity. Um, and inactivity tends to increase as people get older. Um, a fifth of men and a quarter of women are actually classed as completely inactive, which is the most dangerous. Um, and 85,000 people die in the UK each year due to the impacts of a lack of physical activity. So, yeah, people who cycle regularly are generally less prone to obesity, diabetes, strokes, heart disease and various cancers. Um, and I think it's a generally quite a common misconception that cycling is dangerous, but actually the reality is that inactivity is, um, carries a far greater risk. So it's actually estimated that about £7.4 billion pounds a year is the cost to the NHS from the kind of illnesses that are caused by inactivity. Um, on top of this, mental health is a big issue. It's becoming something that we're much more aware of and activity or physical activity can really alleviate depression, stress and anxiety. Um, which can lead to further mental health problems as well. 
Um, so people who cycle generally report significantly improved mental health and well-being and happiness. So yeah, so active travel is a magic cure. Uh, as we've heard from some of the other speakers, um, it's a way to incorporate active travel, activity, sorry, into your, your daily life. Um, it can actually make it a really easy way to be more active. So, um, moving on to the next slide, which is about the benefits for everyone. Um, so cycling or walking can have a huge benefit for individuals, but actually also has a massive benefit for society and for the environment. So, um, you know, reduced air pollution, reduced noise, reduced congestion, reduced injuries and deaths from traffic accidents, healthier streets and more green spaces, um, a reduced carbon footprint for individuals and for our society as a whole. Um, and the result can be actually more attractive, healthy places for all of us to live, work and play and do business. So there's so many benefits um, all around. Finally, just want to talk about the joy of cycling generally. Um, I know a lot of these kind of benefits can seem a bit academic, but actually cycling is just really, um, you know, it makes you feel happy, it's fun. It's a great family activity. Um, it's a really nice way to share something with your children or with your friends. Um, and it's a great way to get around for free. Um, just to share one little personal story. Um, I took my little boy to hospital this morning in the bike trailer. And at first I was really nervous about it. And, and I used to cycle to work all the time. But since having children, it's kind of that's created an additional barrier for me. And um, I was really nervous about doing this in the bike trailer. It was a route that I hadn't done before. I was worried about getting there on time. Um, but I just decided to do it. And on the way, I just felt this kind of sense of elation um, for having done it. And it's just, yeah, it's just a really happy way to travel around and saved me time and money in the morning as well. So that's, that's all from me. Um, don't know if you want to follow up with anything, Luke? Sorry, just, just trying to find the unmute button. <laughs> um, thanks so much, Ruth, for sharing that. It's great to hear you. You got to the hospital for the appointment on time and <laughs> yeah, um, got, really. got there in the bike trailer as well. So yeah, it was amazing. I can just imagine little Sammy. Uh, marching out of the bike trailer and into the hospital. It's um, <laughs> pretty special. Um, thanks so much for sharing that, Ruth. Obviously, um, I think most people, um, if they weren't convinced about all the benefits of, of cycling uh, before now, I hope they are now, um, because the list is pretty long, as, as you've kind of said there. And on top of all the, the academic elements, just the, the fact that it brings so much happiness and ease to all of the panelists' lives, um, we're going to go uh, now and we're going to just use the last 10 minutes um, to just run through a quick Q&A. Um, I've got a couple of questions and I'm sorry, I'm just juggling a couple of screens here. Um, so I've got a couple of questions um, here that have been sent through to me uh, by my colleague Reese. Thank you, Reese. Um, I've got first up a question for Sylvia. Um, what would be the number one thing that someone can do to make it easier for other people to cycle in central London? Um, based on, you know, surveys after surveys, the one biggest deterrent for people to cycle more um, is the lack of protective um, lanes. So, I mean, the central London is, uh, is great. They've got quite a lot of um, a good provision now. Uh, it's just the links from um, elsewhere that is missing. So, for instance, from Brent, um, it's quite, you know, all, we can go all the way to, it starts to, re, to be really good from um, Hyde Park, for instance. Uh, but, you know, in between Brent and Hyde Park, it's not that great. So, it's, it's always the same thing. Um, a space for cycling on Main Road, um, quite a street with measures like low traffic neighbourhoods, and just create a connected network that is uh, safe, direct and convenient and comfortable for everyone. Wonderful. Thank, thanks, Sylvia. 
Um, another question here, uh, Shivaji, you, you mentioned that um, the, the, the changing the tire um, is something that um, everyone can kind of think about and they may or may not be able to do that. Um, but uh, just uh, in terms of learning basic bike maintenance skills, just the bare essentials, where, where uh, would you recommend people kind of start to look first for that kind of um, those kind of skills or, or somewhere to learn? The things that they so, might uh, need. A, a couple of thoughts on that. I think um, it hasn't been said explicitly so far, so it's worth saying that the, the national cycling organisations are great. Uh, obviously, Sustrans also, um, and forgive me for mentioning them, but British Cycling and um, Cycling UK, um, they're great opportunities to get um, a bit of reassurance, feeling of, of knowing other people it, um, involved in the same area and so on. Um, then your local bike shop has got to be a place to start. They've been, um, in some cases, criticised for being a little bit intimidating. I'm not sure that's always fair. And the best of them are definitely not. They're, they're really friendly places to be. So anyone you know would be able to rec rec recommend one. Here in Birmingham, I can recommend the Bike Boundary. Um, that's not much good if you're in Westminster right now. Um, but, but I'm sure others will have suggestions. Um, and then it's worth bearing in mind that for some people, just checking out a YouTube video will demystify a lot. Um, I've certainly spoken to people who feel a lot better after doing that. Um, and finally, it's worth just bearing in mind that, that I, I know I say I, I think it's empowering to be able to, to do these repairs. Um, but in some cases, just paying to get it done is the best way. Um, uh, and just pay the local bike shop a fibre to fix your repair and give you a bike back that works. Amazing. Th thank you so much for that, Shivaji. Um, I've got another question here for Ruth. Um, that would be, um, if, if someone was uh, trying to help make uh, cycling for everyone, so making sure that uh, it appeals to everyone and it doesn't seem like some kind of uh, exclusive club, what, what can just the, the general person do um, to help promote uh, cycling? Um, to be seen as an inclusive thing that that is open to everyone. Um, do you mean like in their workplace or? Yeah, in a, in a workplace would be a good good example. Yeah, so I think first of all, um, you know, talking to people in the workplace about what their needs are is really important. So I, I think that's the first step in terms of making it inclusive is finding out what people want and what people need, um, making sure that the facilities and the equipment that people need is available if possible, doing what you can to do that. Um, I think, yeah, being, being flexible in a workplace is great if possible. So just accepting that, you know, time, you know, maybe accepting timing, but sometimes um, if you can work flexibly and travel like slightly outside of rush hour, for example, that might help someone to travel actively. Um, I know that's not always something that would be possible, but just thinking about all the different sort of elements really and talking to people and individuals, I think is the most important thing. Can I come in there with, with one thing about um, workplace cycling? So, so I, cycling works, obviously works to try and bring together employers. And, and I think it'd be fantastic to see uh, business improvement districts like this one um, support that work. There's obviously a cycling works in London. But, but beyond that, the, the thing that, that I hear about most, and I think that I felt most strongly, is just security for your bike. Being able to put a bike somewhere where you'll find it when you come back is an enormous um, thing. And, and uh, you know, as a lawyer, I've obviously worked in a variety of um, uh, firms. And quite often, there's a real cultural differences difference between a firm that might tell you that um, their office contains a load of British design classics and therefore you're not allowed to wheel your Brompton through and into the building. It'll have to be locked up outside, um, to which my response is Brompton's a British design classic better than anything you've got here, but okay. Um, and other places where, like my current um, employer, where, where I'm able to um, cycle into the staff car park and find a, um, a secure place to put my bike. And therefore it makes it really easy to get in every day. Um, and the biggest worry is taken away. Mm. I see Sarah nodding. I'm guessing that, you know, you invest in a nice new bike. You really don't want to leave that gorgeous pink bike somewhere where it might not be there. No, definitely. Like finding somewhere to, to lock a bike is a big struggle, especially like 
what no one told me is how difficult it is to learn how to lock your bike in a way which is graceful. Um, especially cause I like a lot of, a lot of women have a step through bike. Um, yeah. so I can, so I can get on and off at it easier, but that just means there's sort of like less places to, um, to lock it. So, you know, when I can find somewhere that has proper, proper things designed to have a bike rather than a just like random lamppost, um, yeah. it makes my life a hell of a lot better. Yeah. I mean, I think there's so, there's so many different elements and I think, that, you know, any workplace don't assume that like what you've set up will be something that works for everybody. So making sure that you are having those conversations with everybody about what they need is, is so important. Um, and then on a more individual level, yeah, I think people supporting each other is really great as well. It's kind of buddy rides and running um, group activities in your workplace and activities that can kind of allow people to have a go and do something in a social environment can be really helpful. Amazing. Um, I've just got one last question for Sarah um, and then we're going to uh, call it a day because we're just coming up to one o'clock now. Um, Sarah, you, you talked a bit about um, when you were first taking those first few journeys, you started through a park and then you started on a um, a pedestrianised high street and then the next thing you were kind of travelling on all sorts of different routes. Uh, for people new to cycling, how would you recommend they, um, I guess, choose their, choose their routes first up and get to understand what they might be comfortable taking on um, before throwing themselves into a space they might not quite feel ready for? Yeah, for sure. Um, my biggest piece of advice is to find someone who you trust and who you're comfortable with to go out with you. So, so I was really lucky that my partner, you know, joined me on loads of rides. I actually only went on my big, you know, first ride into central London on my own last week. So like, I'm very new to, 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 to this. Um, but having someone who will go with you and who can sort of, you know, signal to cars so that you don't have to worry about taking your hands off the handlebars. That's been a big thing for me. Um, and I think as well, you know, go to places where you're familiar um, and, and go to places sort of early in the morning and later in the day when they're where, or in the middle of the day, if it's a road, when they're, when they're going to be a little bit more quiet. Um, what I found for me is I never, I never actively went on a ride that I wasn't comfortable with because I tend to get like really crabby. If I'm, if I'm scared, I get mean. So that's not very nice for anyone. Um, but what I did is I found myself frustrated at the borders of my journey. And then I gradually were ex was expanding them. Um, you know, when my partner would be like, okay, well, this is where we get off and, and walk across this intersection. And I'd be like, Oh, that's such a drag. I'm just going to ride across it. Um, and sort of like let my own mind tell me when I was ready to do things rather than sort of push myself out of my comfort zone. Um, you, it comes much faster than you'd think. I, that's all I can tell you. Amazing. Amazing. It's, um, I, I think you're right. I think people will find that once they get started on something and just have a go at it, um, that's how you, how you learn to, to start to feel more and more comfortable with more and more spaces. Um, we're going to wrap it up there because we're right on one o'clock. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. Um, again, to all the panelists uh, for sharing all, all your thoughts and your experiences um, and your wisdom with us today. Thanks everyone um, who are joined um, as an attendee. Um, and obviously thanks to the South Westminster bid. So thanks to North Bank bid, Westminster bid and Victoria Westminster bid as well. Um, just uh, a reminder to everyone, if you do have any more information, if you do want any more information about um, walking and cycling in central London, jump on the North Bank's website and just search cycling in there, You'll, it'll take you to their uh, cycling page. Um, and there's some more resources on there. Um, thanks everyone.